I'm not entirely sure what happened, so I'm going to keep going. Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the New England Retreat. Today is the last day of our retreat, and we're going to be talking about communication, Communication 101. So before we get started, I'm going to start us off with a word of prayer as we have people trickle into our Zoom room. So please just bow your head, heads and close your eyes as we get started. So Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for bringing us to the end of this retreat weekend. I want to thank you for all of the conversations and talks that we were able to have and the wisdom that was shared. Lord, I pray that as we um, have this conversation today about communication, that you give us the wisdom that we need to hear as we continue on into this year. We continue with our work relationships, our home relationships, and our family relationships. Please bless the panelists and guide them in, the, in our conversation. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. 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 amen, amen. Okay, so um, I'm going to just start with some brief introductions. I see the Jacksons on screen. Hello, guys. Good morning. Hello. 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 <laughs> and I see uh, Brandon and Sharetta Taylor as well. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. So um, my name is Sarah Storr. I am gonna be the moderator for today's talk. I am from New York City, born and raised, and I am currently a teacher here. I teach high schoolers. I teach grades nine, 10, and 12. Our panelists today, we have Dr. Thomas and Lorreen Jackson. Um, they are from Tennessee and they organize what is what we all know as the Meat Ministries. This is a lifestyle center, a gospel medical missionary training school, and they also conduct seminars worldwide. Um, they've been married for a very long time, and they're going to be sharing with us a lot of the things they have learned in their marriage. Next up on our panelists, we have Branda and Shreda, and they are from Philadelphia. Um, and most of us, I know them through their YouTube channel, Worth the Wait. And on their channel, they talk a lot about Christian courtship, family life, parenthood, and other life matters. So I'm really excited for us to hear from both couples about communication. So I'm seeing a lot of activity on my screen as people roll in. Um, so we're going to get started. We're going to get started with our questions. Okay, so today's topic is Say What You Mean, Communication 101. So the first question I have is, I just had a baby and every time I tell my husband that my back hurts or I'm in pain, he quickly changed the subject and or thinks I'm just complaining. It makes me feel like he doesn't care. What should I do? young couple speak to that <laughs> okay <laughs> we'll take a first stab at it and then allow the uh much more experienced couple to come in and and, <laughs> and help us out um but for us you know when we were thinking about that question i think that for me i hear somebody who you know needs to take ownership for what they're feeling um and be assertive in communicating that with you know her husband um so oftentimes when we don't take ownership or when we're not communicating clearly um, about what we're feeling, the other person may not even know what, you know, their, their, their reactions are, are causing or, or how their um, expressions are affecting another person. And so what we would say to that is just to encourage the, the wife in the situation to use phrases such as, you know, when this happens, it makes me feel this way. Or um, I know you may not intend to do this, but this is how this is making me feel, right? And, you know, allowing her husband to have that space to really hear, you know, how his actions or how his, you know, deflections are really making uh, are affecting her. And then for them to be able to have healthy conversation about, you know, how to move forward. And, you know, she could give ideas about, you know, specific ways that he's able to help with the situation, uh, but really doing her best to make sure that, you know, he is aware of how his actions are really affecting her and making her feel. Uh, yeah, I'll just chime in really quick. Um, you know, having a baby for a couple is like a really um, shifting time, right? There's so many things that, that change for a couple. And so I think a lot of grace during that postpartum period is really needed on both sides. 
um, has the husband being grateful and understanding what his wife has just gone through and is still going through because they say, you know, it takes about 18 months to fully recover from giving birth. Um, and I know people typically think it's six weeks, but there's still a whole lot more happening after that. And then um, also on her side, understanding this is a shift for him too as a husband. And although he may not have physically endured the challenge of giving birth, he might have his own emotional and mental challenges he's going through, especially with the nature of you know his relationship with his wife changing because now she's tending to a baby. So they need a lot of grace with each other. Um, one thing I would also suggest along with Brandon saying about her being a little bit more assertive is also being more specific about how he can help her, right? So instead of just saying like, you know, my back hurts, I'm in pain, um, also kind of share what he can do to help because, you know, m men are more solution oriented. When you tell them, you know, something is wrong, they're thinking about how can we fix it? What can I do? So maybe he's hearing her feelings, but he's just like, what do you want me to do about that? Or he doesn't even understand where it could be coming from. So I would recommend for her to get specific, like, you know, can you, uh, after I feed the baby or if she's breastfeeding or whatever it is, can you change the baby's diaper or can you help with dinner? Like whatever it is, just get specific with him about how he can help you through this challenge um, that she's having so that he knows how to respond more. That's excellent because uh, uh, most of the time, the man is not aware of what the woman is going through especially after the child, he, he starts to feel rejection and he, he's not getting his needs. And so he's wanting to get you to understand where he is. And so I think also with that, uh, that's where she has to let him know that he's, he, he's important to her as well as this baby. And that, okay, I'm going through some physical changes but I, I need you right now to help me with this and involve him in it. And I think it will help a lot because in order to affect the change, we got to communicate what the problem actually is. Okay, awesome. So I'm hearing for this um, specific couple, we need a lot of um, specific, like let's name the problem and then let's all try to name a solution or what you know you may be thinking could help so that we can kind of move forward. And also hearing the, uh, the husband and what his needs may be. So we're naming specific feelings and emotions and needs. Awesome. And her so physical, her physical uh, infirmities are also there. And she's, I think according to the question, she's thinking that Okay, I'll tell him what's wrong, and then he's going to automatically just adhere. But that's, right. not, that's not happening there. He, he needs some pulling into and being able to know that he's a part of, he's a part of this as well. She didn't just, she, had, she physically birthed the baby, but they had to have the baby together. She didn't get it by herself. Right. So how, how does she avoid him feeling like she's complaining? Like, how does she avoid coming off as maybe nagging or complaining? Let me just add a point here. As I look at this question, it says, it makes me feel like <clears throat> he doesn't, doesn't care. care. Mm -hmm. What should I do? What I found in my years, there's three God-given inner needs that we all have from God. Love significance and security, love, significance and security. Now, I want to be very clear, we hold people responsible for our happiness and our well-being. And so this is a real situation you're going through, but what can she do? First of all, I see where that you get married, we understand that the person we married is the one that's going to make us happy and bring all the joy we need in our lives. And we do not understand the purpose of marriage. Now, I must say this, then I'm going to finish. Marriage was not designed to make you happy. What do you think about that? <laughs> all right. 
Marriage is designed. <laughs> I want you to listen to me. No. I've been, mar I've been married to this woman. Next week, it'll be 50 years. 50 mm -hmm. years. Okay? <laughs> and so, as I coach and counsel folks, and as these things happen in our marriage, such as this case, when you enter into a marriage relationship, once you enter, a man does not marry a woman, a woman does not marry a man. They marry the history. They bring suitcase into the marriage. And the suitcase is not open until after the honeymoon. Suitcase of past hurt, rejection, lack of love. So, therefore, her feelings now, she can't control that man. If that man is not in Christ, because I understand this man here, because I don't know him, but I know this. If this man get a connection with Christ, he will see his wife through the eyes of Christ as Christ treated his wife. And therefore, the pain she feel, he will feel the pain. And therefore, it will move not with sympathy, but with compassion and to move. So no matter what she do, she can complain all day long. That man is not going to respond unless his heart is in Christ. Now, in the meantime, while Christ is working on his heart, she has to really say, Lord, where is she? Her happiness, her joy, especially going as my dear sister, going through this pregnancy, which is a very serious, delicate moment in her life, and she got it. She wants. She's looking for comfort, consideration, and like I said, you can be specific to the husband. Yeah, honey, I need this, 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 and I've seen that over years. Begrudgingly, the man said, "Okay, okay, okay," and it does not do anything for the woman feeling because it's not showing genuine concern and care. So my prayer for her is that, my dear. Well, raise this question, and first of all, you got to understand your love, your security is in the hands of God, and God will work on that man. And so the complaint, release it to God. John 15 says that if you abide in me and I in you, you're going to bear fruit. So if she realized that during this moment, God, you got to give me comfort in my time of having this experience. She got to talk to God. She got to mm -hmm. communicate with God. See, this is nothing natural. This is supernatural. God has that baby covered, but he has to cover her because her disposition attitude is going to transmit into that fetus. You know, she go through depression, emotion. Therefore, it's going to create some condition that will even in the fetus. So she's going to go to God and cry out to God. You see, prayer is the answer to every life experience. We don't understand that. Her situation, Lord, you got to give me comfort in this and give me words, as they say, give me words to communicate with my husband in a way that you want me to communicate. She got to be a woman of prayer during this time. It might sound to be archaic, but I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. Go mm -hmm. ahead, I'm finished with that. Brandon Short, I see you too smiling. Do you have anything to add to? Just saying that this was a really sophisticated way for us to glean from the Jacksons from their years of experience. So this is all for that, for us to learn from you all. Still Here, learning. Congrats. Still learning. <laughs> the years doesn't mean we have arrived yet. No. <laughs> Appreciate you all. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next question. Um, so we're in a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship now. Uh, I guess, we, we, or other words, we're courting. So every time I ask my girlfriend if she is okay, she says she is fine. However, I can tell something is upsetting her. How can I get her to be more direct with me and tell me what the problem is so I can fix it? Yeah, I can to our young couple, then we'll comment on that. <laughs> um, so I'm hearing a couple of things. Uh, first is that he seems to be sensing that something's going on and she's not communicating it and he wants her to open up more. Um, typically when this, uh, this type of like, I guess, kind of cold um, way of communicating is, is going on, 
it's a lot deeper than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I would kind of recommend getting to the root of why she doesn't feel comfortable opening up. Is it still a trust issue or just in the past? Is that the way that she learned how to communicate? Um, so he's going to have to, you know, <laughs> he's going to have to try to at least get to the basics of why she's not comfortable sharing um, before we can even get to, I think the last part of the question is, so I can fix it. Um, Before you can even get there, you're going to have to try to understand why isn't she comfortable sharing. Um, And then I guess just as we've said, we're probably going to continue to say this throughout the rest of the session, but assertiveness is just so important in relationships and being able to own how you feel and communicate what that's doing to you in the relationship. And he's gonna have to um, very gently just communicate with her that I can sense physically that, you know, there's something wrong and that you're not okay, even though you're saying that. You know, if I'm really off in, in, in that assessment, let me know. But when you don't open up to me, this is how it makes me feel. And here is what I'm trying to do. Um, she probably just needs, you know, might need to be Uh, feel more secure as well. Um, That's something to consider and why she may not, you know, confide in him. So there's a couple things going on, but that's probably where I would start. Just why isn't she comfortable opening up and how can we kind of figure out what's going on there? Right. There's there's a lot going on um, in this situation. And I guess one of the, a couple of things that pop out to me um, was that number one, this may be a boundary for her. You know, whatever whatever the matter is that she's dealing with, um, they're only dating, right? I think that you know, your boyfriend right. and girlfriend. So there may be some sensitivity around whatever that issue is that she's just not comfortable going there in a dating relationship, which is like completely fine. Um, we talk to people all the time about the boundaries in your conversations, um, and, and depending on what type of relationship you're in, so friendship and dating relationship and courtship and engagement and marriage and so on and so forth. So this could be just a boundary that she set up and, um, you know, him communicating about how he's feeling in that situation um, could allow her to be able to share and open up about why this is or, or why she's not comfortable going into this area of their, of, of her, whatever she's experiencing. Um, I think the second point is that I was, I was clinging in on the, um, so that I can fix it piece. And I think that sometimes, well, oftentimes men, like Toretta mentioned earlier, we're very quick to jump to a solution for a problem. Um, so when I knew it, I, early on in our relationship, when Sharetta would share certain things with me, I would immediately respond back with, all right, here's what you can do. Here's the solution. Here's how you can approach it. Here's, you know, here's what you should do to, to, to resolve whatever's going on. And what I learned through experience is that many times, nine out of 10 times, the, the woman in that relationship really just wants you to listen. Um, she wants you to hear. She wants to be heard. She wants to be understood. And many times that's all that she really is looking for in that, in that exchange of, of information, that exchange of communication. Um, so maybe perhaps in the past, this man has displayed a very heavy, I'm going to fix it mentality. And that has caused her now to be more resistant to sharing about what could possibly be going on in her, in her situation, what she's feeling. She doesn't want a solution. All she wants is for this man to listen and to genuinely hear what she has to share. Um, so I think approaching it like that, like you know, for, to this man, if this man were in the audience today, I would say, when you're in these situations, ask your girlfriend um, or woman in your life, um, are you telling me this to just for me to listen? Or are you telling me this for a solution? And that question has saved me so much stress in our relationship. <laughs> now that I've learned it, right? Um, Sharon, are you telling me this because you just want me to hear you? Or do you actually want me to come to you with solutions or with approaches for this problem? Yeah, a uh, couple of things. She said sincerity and trust. Then, mm. you know, when I look at this question at the end, we're talking about fix it. <laughs> you know, we all have a God complex. Now, what is a God complex? We can fix it. And John 15, 5 tells me, without Christ, you can do nothing. Mm. So the young man got to come to the point, look at that verse, I can't fix it. You know why? Because how can something broke fix something broke? You hear what I just said? How can something broke fix something broke? Because in your life, you are now expressing something to her. And as you said, there's a boundary there. 
there's a sense of insecurity and a protection. And he has to be quick to hear. Now, he don't have, I, I would suggest, he don't have to go to the, late, the young girl and say, now, do you want me to just listen so I can fix it? That's the wrong statement. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells in the book of James, he said, you got to be quick to listen and slow to speak. So automatically, as a husband, I have to be quick to listen. When this is a girlfriend. Well, You're hello, not married it, to well, her yet. Well, mm -hmm. that even make it more complicated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe y'all gonna kick me off the screen, but I don't find nowhere in the Bible say girlfriend. Now, when I look at this at, at the sanctuary, there's three areas here. <laughs> you got outside of the sanctuary. That's friendship. When you come into that outer court, that's courtship. And in that outer court, that means prerequisite for marriage is conversion. Hello? If you're not converted, you're going to have problems. Then you go into, uh, into engagement, then to, into marriage. So here we got a situation. Here's a young man, got a God complex. That's not a combination. I had a God complex. I can fix it. You know, I can't even fix myself. Emotionally unstable, spiritual immature. And so, number one, he can't fix it. Number two, he got to listen. When a person communicates, you got to listen to what they are not saying. You got to be able to hear, as God for the ear, because the words is not saying what's really deep, as you're saying, in the heart. You understand what I'm saying? So we're not listeners. And the fact is, they talking. There's two types of communication. Assertive communication. That means you communicate mm -hmm. and give clarity exactly what you want out of this situation. Assertive. You make it plain. Make it plain. Then the most important to me is what I call active listening. Active mm -hmm. listening. That when I'm communicating, when my wife talking to me, because women, they love to communicate. They like to Absolutely. talk. Absolutely. They got, they want That's details. Right. That's right. Men, get me to the bottom line. So therefore, my wife, <laughs> you know, I, I'm already, if I'm not actively listening, she's communicating, I have learned. I got to listen to her because I just want to know what it is. Am I right, young lady? Don't you want details? Look at it. Look at I, it. Look at it. Huh? I didn't know the whole reason why. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Then she followed me around the house. <laughs> I can't be, have no privacy. And then I learned. I got to sit and learn. <laughs> I won't tell you other places you follow me. But anyway, so active listening, I got to Now, active listening, when I'm talking to my wife, it's not that I'm, I'm listening, I'm looking around like this. It's eye to eye content, body yes. language, yes. facial expression. You know, your face, the Bible says a face, face. answer a face. So that young man, number one, cannot fix his wife. It's not his wife. I mean, whoa, yeah, I forgot, I'm sorry. Girlfriend. Not, I'm scared of that word. <laughs> I had a girlfriend She's 50 years ago. Girlfriend. I messed it. <laughs> but anyway, the relationship. So yeah. therefore, he cannot fix it. Secondly, he needs to understand that if he really gonna have a relationship, he got to have an ear to hear. Listen to her heart. Mm -hmm. Listen. Don't say now. Now, I want to hear you so I can fix it. Please delete that out of your vocabulary. Listen to it. Ask God to give you discernment, and then you're able to express. Because like you said, my brother, that she want an ear. Women, you know, it's not so much what you got to do tangible. They need an ear. Mm -hmm. They need to know that you have sensitivity and compassion, and you're giving them your undivided attention, and you're there. And that will break the barrier because she feel already insecure with that. You got to create an environment where she feels safe to share her feeling. She's not going to dump her feeling to somebody that talks about, I can fix it, and who can I do? No. Jesus said, listen. That's what I suggest mm -hmm. to the young man. Listen mm -hmm. to the young lady that she finds her security in the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, we got some gems being dropped. Wow. <laughs> okay, so um, I think that was really interesting because the the assumption is to jump to want to fix, but we're hearing 
listening and discernment from the Holy Spirit is really key as we communicate with one another in romantic relationships, marriage relationships, right? So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Everything points back to the Holy Spirit. We are getting direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I know that we also spoke a lot about what the guys should do, but I will also say from <clears throat> the woman's side, please do not say you're fine if you're going to continue to kind of be off-putting in your body language and in your behavior, um, because that that's not going to be pleasant and enjoyable to be around. It's very confusing. There's nothing worse than, you know, somebody saying, I'm fine, and then it's like very rolling your eyes or like whatever you're doing, it's very Absolutely. communicating you're not okay. So if you are going to say because you don't want to talk about it, your actions need to follow that as well and not make it difficult for him to continue to be around you or, you know, continue to, to talk to you. So I wanted, I wanted to add that in there too. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Mm-hmm. That's very, very good because uh, I think I love that you touched on body language because that is a huge communication piece, right? Mm-hmm. Language is huge. So... We're going to move into the realm of friendships now. Um, A lot of us are in friendships. If we're not married or if we're single, we do deal with friendships. So someone is asking, why is my friend so sensitive? She offended me. So I told her directly what she did to offend me. But she got upset at the way I approached her instead of acknowledging what she did wrong. How can I convince her that she needs to apologize? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all right y'all want to take a shot at that there's a couple of questions pulled in there right um mm-hmm. yeah why is my friend so sensitive um so I, I think that um you know we just moved right and so when we moved i had to actually end up shipping a couple boxes to our house in advance of us um and how I packaged those those boxes, you know, actually ended up spoiling some of the content that was inside. Uh, some of the stuff got damaged and ruined, and as it, as it got shipped here. And so what I what I share that why I share that is because sometimes the way that we package what we're what we're sharing with somebody could also end up spoiling the message. So you may have very good intentions with um, you know what you're saying and what you're sharing with this person, but how you the tone. I think I think I saw Herb mention the tone in the chat earlier. The tone. You know your your approach, your demeanor um, mm-hmm. can oftentimes spoil the way that that person is able to actually receive what you're saying, what you're sharing with them. Um, and also, like, who really likes to be attacked? Nobody likes to be attacked. Yeah, so whenever no we more. feel like we're being attacked, Absolutely. we mm-hmm. are automatically very defensive, right? About like nobody wants to feel like they're being put on front street or being, you know, put on blast or whatever, like with some behavior that they may have exhibited. Um, so how she may be approaching this person also could be coloring the response. And then last, the last point that I'll share on that and, um, is that you can't convince anybody to want to apologize, right? That's like right. That's Absolutely. a futile effort like that, that will never lead you. That will never lead you anywhere because if they, if she ultimately ends up apologizing, it was only because you convinced her, not because she generally right. had the conviction in her right. heart to want yeah. to apologize. So I, I don't know if you just want to hear the words, I apologize. And like, that's, that's a different matter that we're getting into, but um, it's really not going to be by your own, you know, convincing that this girl is going to, this, this part is a girl, woman, this, this, this woman is going to want to um, apologize to you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, um, <laughs> when I read this, I was like, this person's from Brooklyn. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> because <laughs> I, it sounds to me like this is a person that's very direct and just wants to be straight to the point with what they say and what they request. Um, and I, 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 so I'm from Brooklyn, and I'm also of Jamaican descent. So when you put those two things together, sometimes it could be a little fireball. And I had to learn how to be more gentle. And even though I'm very big on being direct, I'm very big on like, yo, we'll keep it 100, like, what, like, let's get to it. I also had to learn that you cannot just, say whatever it is that you think or how you feel and expect the other person not to like have an emotional response to that. The Bible tells us to let our, let our speech be seasoned with salt, Mm -hmm. to be filled with grace. And so we have to think very carefully about our words and how we're using our words. 
And sometimes the direct approach, it's not going to get you to, it's not going to get the person to realize what you're trying to share. And it's not, might not even make them, you know, feel like they did anything that they need to apologize for, like Brandon just shared, like they're going to be on defense. Um, and that's not what we want. We're trying to resolve an issue. So uh, even just the first question, why is she so sensitive? Sensitive? It's just like, let, let's take a moment to put yourself in her shoes. Could you be saying something? Could your tone, could your actions be doing something that is hurtful to her feelings? Yeah. We don't want to do that, especially if this is someone that you consider to be your friend. You don't want to be hurtful. And so take a step back, try to think about, okay, how could I be wrong? And this is honestly something I try to practice in our marriage as well. I could be so upset about something, but I have to ask myself in the Holy Spirit first, what was the role I played in this? And how can I have done something better? Where did I go wrong? Let me check myself first mm. before I try to check somebody else. You know, the, the scripture says, let me take the beam or the small out of my eye first before I go to somebody else. And that's something I would recommend here is like, it's okay to want to be direct and clear, but don't be so aggressive with that, that you completely miss the mark and you end up hurting someone because we also have to be mindful of that as well. Right. You know, when, you, when you've been offended, you know, forgiveness, that's healing power in forgiveness. It takes one person to forgive, two to reconcile. Very important to understand. Reconcile means come back together. So it only takes one to forgive. Now, when a person offends you, forgiveness is more about you than the person who offended you. Why? Because in forgiveness, it sets you, it gives you grudge free living. It takes the pain out of your heart, et cetera, et cetera. So it's more about you. Then two, when we have a situation like this, it could be in two ways. It could be redemptive or punitive. What I mean by that, that God allowed, he, didn't, he allowed this situation to come because he wanted to get those blind spots out of our lives. We don't know whether we have bitterness, resentment, anger, until we get into a situation. It comes out of us. So God permit that to come. But it does not permit it to condemn us, but to help us to be set free through his grace. And so when you approach a situation like that, where we all encounter, I have to be mindful that I am God's representative, and he wants to reveal to that person through me his redeeming love. So my approach is not one of punitive that that person owe me something. You see, again, when you allow a person who have offended you, they are living rent-free in your head. Do you understand what I just said? Every mm -hmm. time you think about that person who offended you, they living rent-free in your head. Rent-free. Rent. Like you pay rent in an apartment, you ain't paying <laughs> your rent, you got to be evicted. You understand that? So that person is, is living rent-free in our head. And she must give that person eviction notice. Eviction notice, forgiveness. Mm -hmm. When she forgives that person, where God won't forgive, she's evicted. Are you listening to me? And that eviction notice through forgiveness is not, I got to be direct. I've already been offended. And therefore, I don't have to try to convince that person. God does the convincing to that person that they did wrong. You have to be in place of Christ so Christ can reveal his love and his forgiveness. So Christ come to you. He said, forgive her as I forgave you. Mm -hmm. Love her as I love you. Now, that is the biggest challenge in Christian life because we have went through things outside our marriage that has been just horrendous. And through the power of God, just recover your steps. Mm -hmm. But it's not about that person is about you and how you relate to that person. And you can't relate to that person if you're still in yourself. you got to go to God. I'm telling you, I mean, we, we can talk about it, but Christ has to be in possession of your heart. He has to be. We can't do nothing without him. So I'll say to this dear soul with this friend, why she's so sensitive, that's the human nature. That's in that DNA until we are converted. We all got sensitivity. Hmm? You got you got to you got to watch what you say, how you say, it, and all that is good. But the girl is not the the girl may have a problem. You have a problem, so she's not your problem. 
you got a problem. So therefore, you got to look at the lens of God. Like, what is my attitude? As the dear young lady said. So forgive this. Mm -hmm. I tell that young lady, go to that woman and say, I forgive you. And don't expect anything in return. Because God's love is a giving love without expectation. Psalm 62, verse 5. I wait only on the Lord for my, my expectation, expectation is of him. If you're in Christ, your expectation of God, no matter what that woman says, you are being redempted, and down the line, God will recover that step. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Anything you have to no. yeah. I just uh, would add that in trying to get a person to apologize, you mm -hmm. can't make a person apologize to you. If you mm -hmm. see something, or then go to that person and just acknowledge what's happening. Set and free. Yeah, and mm -hmm. let them, let the Lord work on them to be able to apologize. You can't force apologies. That's right. Absolutely. It's such an interesting concept of friendships being a mirror, showing us the things in us like bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness. Absolutely. Yes, and I, I definitely agree, and I've seen that in my own yeah. life. Um, you know, even when I interact with my students, I'm like, I have such resentment when they disrespect me. But I mm -hmm. see that that has come up in my friendships and letting go of resentment in friendships mm -hmm. has allowed me to let go of resentment with that student teacher relationship. Yeah. Um, you know, that, before you go on what you're mm -hmm. saying, because there are blind spots in our lives that we are not really aware of. You know, we got our right. struggle. You know what I'm saying? But see, in Romans 7, 23, it's talk about the law of sin in our members. So here, mm -hmm. whether you're 20, 30, I've been 75 this year. That's 75 yeah. years, you know, life when I'm conceiving my mother womb that I bring to my time mm -hmm. all the pains and the hurts, the rejection, etc. That's in there. Mm -hmm. Now, when I come to God, I confess my known sin. You get what I'm saying? But God is going deeper into the recess of our heart and pulling these things out one by one. You remember when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, I'm not going to drive the nations out all at it once because they've been 400 years in bondage. 400 years have not learned how to trust God, love God. So God is so merciful. So he drove the nation out one by one because if it drove the nation all at once, wild beasts would have came in and devolved them. So in our lives, if he revealed to you and I all of our sins, 75 years of sin, <laughs> What would that do to me? Crush It would you. kill me. Mm -hmm. You see, God is My merciful. Life. So these situations is part of the pruning process. These situations, I have looked at and said, Lord, you are working with me. Show me these blind spots. I still got anger in my heart. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I thank you. I thank you for the person you brought in my life. It's not, she, she's not the one that's causing my problem. You using her to help me to see I'm an angry person. Mm. Yes. <laughs> I release this anger to you, Father, in exchange of your love. Does that make sense to you? We have to walk in that area. And God, therefore, the people don't be, they're not our enemies no more. They're not our enemies. Hmm? So like you said, in, in teaching, yes. You can have some students, really wild child and some might love the teacher, you know, other you see. <laughs> and most students, God put you there in that place to save you. Yes. I, I think it goes back to what we, we were talking about when you're abiding in Christ, you are tree. Right. He, he prunes you, right? Oh, if you're absolutely. that fruit, he starts mm -hmm. to prune that fruit. So, yes. So, we have another question here. And we're now getting a little bit deeper into that relationship with church that some people may have. So it says, my church officials forced me into a position, but I loathe church board meetings. Every time I try to quit, they guilt trip me into staying. How can I leave my church position without them accusing me of leaving the faith? <laughs> I think this is a lot here. Got a lot of church hurt sometimes. First of all, <laughs> it says my church official Force me, mm. force me. Right there is just a red flag. How do they force you? They bribe you, what they force you. You know, you have a free will. That's one thing God has given us. You have to make an intelligent 
biblical decision. Mm -hmm. So therefore you've been forced into that church position and therefore you did not want it in the first place or you hate board meetings. And so every time you try to quit, they put the guilt, guilt trip on you saying, how can I leave my church position with, without them accusing me of leaving the faith? So that let me know that- That's control. Well, that's control, but that let me know that the person has a battle themselves. Yeah. They need to know exactly- Who they are. What God want them to do, mm -hmm. because no one can force you to do anything. And so they have allowed themselves to be put in that position that has put them in such a delicate position. Now she is fearing, or whoever is fearing, to leave the position because she's going to be falsely accused of leaving the faith. And so, she, number one, she got to come grips with her own reality that if this is a position that she does not feel she qualified for, and she has to go to the folks and let her know, and therefore she has to be definitive. I'm not qualified. I cannot accept this position because of this. I give my papers to you, and res resin resignation of it. And that doesn't mean when you leave a church board meeting, you leave in the faith. Right. How do you associate leaving the church board meeting of uh, leaving the faith? I was an elder of a church. And therefore, because of the ministry we're in, I take eldership as very important. It's more than showing up on Sabbath and giving prayer meetings or, or a prayer. You're eldership, opening up the church. Open up the church. It's, it's service to the church. It's training. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's deep. It's an ordained, sacred position. And so I found that the ministry is pulling me uh, from that and et cetera, et cetera. And so I resigned my position. And I recommended someone else. But I didn't resign from the church. Mm -hmm. Hello? Mm -hmm. I resigned from eldership because I knew that I could not feel that capacity. So this person here, number one, is not to allow human beings dictate, look, I'm resigning my position because I'm not comfortable. I cannot fulfill it. And do not have to say, now, don't think that I'm leaving the church. You don't have to go down that pathway. By, they, by mm -hmm. your fruit, go tell them. When I resigned from eldership, I didn't tell them, now, I'm not, I'm not leaving the church because I'm resigning from the eldership. Mm -hmm. huh. No. Make it plain. Resign because you're not called for it. And whatever else you can do, and continue to work, pray in that church. That's what I see. Mm -hmm. And if you take a position in a church, I believe that this is my own personal belief that if I'm going to take a position. I'm not working for that church. Hello. I'm working for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm going to do something and I'm going to be fearing what the, what the people say, then I'm, I don't need the position. Mm -hmm. God yeah. wants those that are connected to him, not to a man. That's, that's my position on that. You know. It had to be like Enoch before it was translated in Hebrews 11, 5 and 6. He had this one that's one. He pleased God. That's right. Don't be a man, please a church, please. Please mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. Gonna be all right. <laughs> yeah, there, there are a couple things I wanted to say on this as well. Um, <clears throat> number one is I think um, sounds like a little bit of like people pleasing is an issue here as well. Like so feeling the need that you have to say yes because you don't want people to be upset with you or you want right. to like you want to live up to I guess what it seems to be someone expects of you um and that's something personal that needs to be worked out and I think we work that out when we when we go before the Lord and we ask him to order our steps and show us what it is that he wants us to do with the time and the talents he's given us so if I spend time in, in prayer and I'm asking God like what gifts have you given me and how do you want me to use them and he, you know, directs my steps. That means when someone comes to you with an opportunity that's not in alignment with um, what God has shown you he wants you to do, you can say no and you can say in, I don't want to say confidence, but I once heard someone use the word confidence, right? So I can say no firmly because I know that God is not 
calling me to do what you're asking me to do. Mm -hmm. And regardless of how you feel about my no, I'm okay and I'm at peace because I know what What? God is calling me. Absolutely. Um, And and when we are in that space of of really following where God is leading us, we don't get swayed by guilt trips. We don't get swayed by what anyone else thinks because we are sure of what he's leading us to do. And we know it's like, think about Christ. Christ said no. There were times where he was like, I must be about my father's business. I know what it is he's calling me to do. This this is not the time. Like he was clear. He spent those hours in the morning with God. He is the father and he was clear on what his mission was. And he had no problem in those moments of needing to say no to say no. And I think that that's what this person will need as well. Mm Because it also kind of sounds like blame shifting, right? So I was forced or they guilt tripped me and now they're going to question my fate if I, if I resign, don't put it on them. Let's start with your ownership of the situation, your knowledge of what it is God wants you to do. And then from there, take the steps. And then also, yes, it sounds like there could be a little bit of like spiritual manipulation going on. Cause oh, if you're in a place like if you say no, that people are going to question if you even believe in God. There's something far deeper going on there. So I would just start with the best way to do this is get before God, and then you can be sure in your no because you know what He wants you to do. Yeah. Um, and then, as respectful as possible, the scripture gives us so much, you know, guidance on how to take steps when we need to go before our brothers and sisters in Christ. Take the steps that the Bible outlines to say, Look, I made a mistake. I took this position, and I know that it's something I didn't want to do. I apologize if I've wasted anyone's time, but I'm going to resign. Um, If you feel like you want to offer other suggestions on who can take your place, you can do that. But just respectfully go go about backing out and um, know that when you do something that God is telling you to do, don't be worried about the results of it. I want to say that as well. Like, do what he's called you to do um, as, you know, respectfully and as God, like Christ-like as you can. And then disassociate yourself from what you think the results will be. Because if we're constantly worried about how people are going to respond to what we know God told us to do, we're going to be so afraid to make decisions. So I just wanted to add that in there as well. Well said. Well said. Mm. Amen. Amen. And I just want to throw in, I, I think that um, therapy is a really good tool to help you develop a toolbox if you struggle with people pleasing and communicating, um, like when you're in a guilt trip type of phase. I find therapy to be very helpful for me, especially with communication. It really does help you move forward. So I think we have one more t- qu- time for one more question before we go to the audience live Q&A. Um, okay, this is, we'll do a question five. So this is this is a perfect question to end. My wife gets emotional over every little thing and it drives me crazy. I feel like I'm walking on eggshells half of the time. So how do I tell her to chill out just a bit without upsetting her? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, take this first. <laughs> just that word, tell her to chill out, huh? Chill out, yeah. Yeah. That's oh, it. man, who wants to go first? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, young folk. <laughs> All right. Emotional. You know, that's similar to you know, my wife three. gets emotional over every little thing. It drives me crazy. Okay. You know, I think about 50 years ago, <laughs> about my marriage, drive me <laughs> crazy. Now, why was it driving me crazy? Why do you think it was driving me crazy? You want to answer that? Driving me crazy. Why was it driving me crazy? What do you think, brother? <laughs> my think? initial that is that um, there's something going on in you. Amen. Hey, That's for what happened. Got you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now, what do you think is going on in me since? My wife is driving me crazy, everything she say. What's going on? <laughs> if I were talking to a man who was in that situation, I would think that um, his own identity, struggling with his own identity, 
and his ability to, I think, um, have emotional maturity. We were talking about this yesterday during the session. So having emotional maturity and not being at that point where he's ready to, um, I guess, encounter all the different emotions that his wife may be reflecting towards him in a marriage. So was he was he truly ready? My my question would be was you know I think Herc asked in the chat box who was their counselor you know before they got married and did they work <laughs> out you know, different issues um, and some of these important conversations prior to you know saying I do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you know uh, the the family is the foundation of society and marriage is the heart of the family. And the heart of marriage is the husband. In Ephesians chapter 5, it, it gives clear, explicit role, responsibility of the husband. Because you mentioned something there, brother, that there's an identity crisis in that man's life, a lack of spiritual maturity. Because in Ephesians 5, you know, Christ, husband, Love your wife as I love the church and gave myself for her. So Christ was a savior to his wife. Then he says, sanctify her. So the husband in a marriage becomes the savior of the wife. Now, what is a savior? It's one of deliverance. So when that wife comes to you with her emotional distress and problems, That man in Christ is helping her to find Christ-like solution to those problems. It's not about him and her telling her to chill out. Mm -hmm. He needs to step up to the plate and be the Christ, the biblical man that God wanted to be, to be a solution, biblical solution. Then it says sanctify her. Sanctify her means sanctify without the words. The words we speak. Is sanctifying. And so if I'm telling my wife to chill out, oh man, that's devastating. No, <laughs> those words would never come out my mouth. And by the way, only reason to come out your mouth, because as you think in your heart, so, so is you. So it's in your heart. So your heart is not right. And so the young man has to recognize that woman has been placed in his care. And his sacred responsibility as the suitcase is open and all those things come out one by one, he's be a praying man, say, Lord, give me your wisdom how to address my wife's mm-hmm. needs. Amen. And don't feel like, hey, I'm going to sit on the couch and play videos. No, he needs a man of prayer and he needs to recognize the high calling. So, My bottom line, closing point, is the fact that the heart got to be right. And if the young man is not himself spiritually mature, I mean, spiritually mature and emotionally secure, he's not going to help the woman. So he needs to go to the Lord and ask him, give me your grace, forgive me for the words I spoke. Because, you know, I challenge you to do this. Take a tube of toothpaste. Let's take a tube of toothpaste and squeeze it out. Squeeze it all out. You ever done that? Then put it back in the toothpaste too. Do that and let me know what happened. Because yeah. when words, see, what took place in heaven is war in heaven. And I ask people, what kind of war it was? No, definitely it was kicked out. It was a war of words. War of words. Like, like my dear sister said, the words got to be seasoned with salt. Words is life and death is in the tongue. So what that man speak, he can speak life to that wife or he can speak death to that wife. Mm -hmm. And so you got to pray as the scripture said, Lord, put a watch over my mouth, over Mm -hmm. my lips, that I will not sin against you. So when we are affecting that woman or causing any pain, we're bringing pain to the heart of God. Because here's my bottom line. Marriage was designed to protect the heart of God. That's why the woman was made from the rib of man. The rib protects the heart and the lungs, vital. Mm-hmm. 
And Eve was a type of Christ. Jeremiah 6, I mean, type of the church, Jeremiah 6, 2. Adam was a type of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15. So marriage was designed to protect God's heart. And the way I treat my wife, what I say to my wife, I'm saying it to God. If I raise my hand like I'm going to hit my wife, I'm raising my hand to God. My expression is to God. I got to walk in that understanding that this woman is a trustee to me. She's an object for God to express his love through me to her. Mm -hmm. I don't get up and pray in the morning and say, Lord, help that. Because I see another interesting question out here. That, that, this one should have been answered. It, it was Well, we might get back to this, but that number seven question, it says, my husband complained that I haven't cooked for him in three years. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'll stop and get back, but that is something. <laughs> That's something. So, therefore, we have to learn, men folk, men folk, they are the heart of marriage. And we got to look at Christ. How did Christ te treat his wife? Did Christ have a wife? Does Christ have a wife? Absolutely. The church has a wife. So anyway, praise God. I guess we'll come back. And I'd like, I'd like to hear what y'all say about that uh, question there. Did you, have you cooked for your husband? Yeah. How long have you all been oh. married? Huh? Question. Oh, wait, which one? <laughs> Number is it, is number That's seven. Lead us, lead us. Come on. <laughs> How long have been married? Have you been married three years, four years, five years? Uh huh. Seven years. Seven years. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I see that. Uh, still. So she, she froze on us. She froze on us. Yeah, Sarah. It's I don't know if you can hear us, but your screen is frozen. Yeah. Can she hear us? <laughs> we finished, Sarah. I don't we, think. All right. We'll look to you to lead us through that question there. Yeah. Well, it's nine o'clock as we come back and finish these questions here. Okay. Well, Sarah, no. I really appreciate, I appreciate yeah. being on this panel with you guys. It's a breath of spiritual fresh air. Your comments, mm -hmm. practicality. Thank you all. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Yes. Yeah, same over here as well. So we were just going to reflect that, that same sentiment back to you. Um, I guess in closing on this question here, while well, well, Sarah I'm gets her, her Wi-Fi um, situated, somebody told me this one, you know, a long time ago, and it's always stuck with me, is that whenever you see challenges or problems um, taking place in your marriage and your relationship with your wife, um, look at yourself, because oftentimes what you're seeing in your wife is actually a reflection of what's going on in you. Um, and that could be more than, you know, just 100% truth. I mean, when a man is observing some issues or maybe in the situation, some emotional, you know, tendencies in his wife, how much time is he taking to really study his wife, to really learn what are her triggers? What are, what are you know, even before marriage, were they even talking about, you know, you know, with a, a counselor or with a coach or whatnot, um, how to work through some of the different emotions that you can experience in a relationship, right? And so him observing these things taking place in his wife, is he then learning from these observations and not continuing to do the things that are causing the emotional conflict in the relationship? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if they don't currently, if they aren't currently working with a counselor or a relationship coach, I would definitely encourage them to get with somebody who can really help them to navigate these um, these different triggers that are, that are taking place in the relationship. So what may be going on deeper beneath the surface um, that keeps happening. So if you're studying your wife and you're paying attention to her, you're not just focused on your work or on your, your friends or on other things in, in your life, but you're really genuinely studying your wife to know who she is as a person, I think that those triggers will become very clear. And um, hopefully you'll be able to make the changes in your in your life to to make your marriage a, a, a healthy and happy relationship. Amen. Yes, yes. Amen. yes. Praise Real God. Said. Praise Praise God. God. Men need to be observant. Mm -hmm. Study that bride from his side, his queen from his spleen. <laughs> Sarah, you're back. Yeah, my yeah. Wi-Fi right now. I was just I was like, oh my goodness, what happened? I missed the whole conversation. <laughs> oh, Sarah, can I ask you a question? Yes, you can. Are you married? I'm not. No, I'm not. Think about getting married? I am, yes. How soon? I don't know. when the, when the when the Lord says so. 
Are you, are you prepared? I think so. Quite just a little bit more emotional preparation. Oh, okay. We won't put you on the spot. Okay. Yeah. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> we couple won't put you on the spot. Okay. Uh, look at what you walked into there. Look at what you walked into. <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I am sweating. Like, I was not expecting that. Yes, yes. I was. Yeah, I Ready to make it next year. Okay, let's, let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> um, but I think we said we were going to go to... The, the the audience now and okay awesome so first question we have has 12 votes i'm going to try to pin this to the top and question to the top so it says how can women with very who have very little experience with men learn how to communicate with men in a wholesome way to cultivate christian friendships and potential romantic relationships wow yeah. Take the young couple there. A lady. Oh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm still trying to process the question. So very little experience with men. Mm -hmm. Learn how to communicate with men in a wholesome way to cultivate Christian friendships and relationships. I mean, I, I'm sorry. My first thought was just, you know, Communication is communication regardless of who you're talking to. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't put too much pressure on like, I need to, you know, learn how to communicate with men to build a friendship. Like, no, you're going to, as you practice your communication skills in general, you should be doing that in friendship okay. with men so that you can learn um, what it's like, I guess, to <laughs> communicate with the opposite sex. Um, <laughs> That, uh, yeah, I think it kind of answers itself within itself. It's, like it's only going to come from experience and friendship. So are you able to, um, you know, in a respectful way, cultivate friendships with men? Are you able, do you, are you in a place or a setting where that's possible to happen? Because um, that's, that's really where it's going to start. But I don't know how that was my yeah. first thought. One of the things from the chat, I think it was maybe yesterday, Real Talk, was um, singles being a part of community. Right. And so I think that that's also important here that if she's able to find herself, you know, you know, a community, whether it's in her church or just in her, like in her neighborhood, whatever it is, like, you know, that, that healthy, you know, um, Christ centered community that would allow her to be a part of, you know, some groups of people, whether it's mo men, women, all, you know, mixture um, and being able to interact, you know, in that, in that setting, right. In that group mm -hmm. setting to refine our communication, because we can all improve in our communication skills. So I think that um, those group settings are really helpful for, um, and also those, those genuine friendships that you can develop in those settings are really helpful for, you know, building those, you know, healthy communication skills. Um, but also be assured that this is a, um, this is a lifelong, you know, learning process. I mean, I think Dr. Jackson and his, and his wife just had admitted to the fact that you know, they are still learning and, and we're also still in school, of course, in the school of, 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 of marriage and learning about one another, learning how to communicate. So um, also, you know, having grace for yourself to know that this is going to be a process and, you know, something that, you know, hopefully the Lord will continue to teach you as you're growing in him. Amen. I find also in communication and thinking of learning about men, I think in a, in a woman's relationship with her father, plays a key role in her being able to communicate uh, with the male. And if there is no father, an uh, uncle may be uh, helpful. Some may be, you know, uh, some people look to the past of the church, but I think a healthy relationship starts with that woman and her father. Very nice. Very natural ways to practice communicating with men of, uh, people of the opposite sex. So we're going to mark this answer. This is so cool. I'm really enjoying this platform. Why Next question. Fanny? Why are you fanning? Uh, I, I was really just getting over how you put me on a spot like that. <laughs> and then, you know, my Wi-Fi went out. So I just feel like I got hit with a lot of things at once. So I feel like I'm just catching my bearings now. <laughs> 
was good. <laughs> you know, you know, so I'm back, yes. Okay, <laughs> so now we have one um, from the men, and this is a really great question. How can men more effectively communicate their interest in women? So sometimes how it's delivered, such as comments about a woman's shape can be a total turnoff, which I agree, because I don't feel like you should ever be bringing that up, but I digress. So how can they respectfully communicate interest without seeming thirsty or creepy? And please give some examples. Being thirsty and what? Oh, so thirsty, <laughs> like you're desperate, like, you know, like- you should, Oh, you should, oh, like, desperate. Someone. Yeah, like you don't want to come off desperate or creepy or weird, you know? So oh. how, do you, how does a male approach a woman without giving like, you know, these weird vibes? Dr. Jackson, please teach us. What did you say? I said, Dr. Jackson, please teach us. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, um, let me say this. When I'm doing pre-marriage counseling, it depends on the faith of the individual. Now, if they are Seventh-day Adventist Christians, my highly recommendation that will answer the question for them to read the first seven chapters of Adventist Home, the first, and, and I'll suggest Sarah, Sarah dear, <laughs> I'll ask you to read the first seven chapters of Adventist Home. I'm serious. That would help them in the process of friendship. And so here's, I'm dealing with that now, right now with some folks, and the person has an interest. They want to know, should I express my feelings to this person? I said, no. No, you should not. You should first go to God and ask God to really, you know, give you the grace and power that you can put your emotions in check under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Because even though you have an interest in that young lady, you do not want to begin to share those emotional feelings, then you're going to create an environment that will lead you down a path of pain and hurt. Mm -hmm. you, you know, and most folks say, you know, uh, you know, even your body language, you, you can give her gifts, flowers, and you haven't even made a, you haven't even come to the place where this is the one that God wants you to marry. Mm -hmm. Even though you have a feeling, we have feelings. So you don't want to fight the feeling, but you want to bring them under subjection of a higher power under God direction ship. That means you got to commune with God those feelings. Lord, I have these strong feelings. I need for you to take control here. And that's a battle because God don't want us to be robots, but those feelings can be sanctified feelings. Mm -hmm. So my first thing, I would not encourage a young man or woman to express the intent for a woman until God approves. You understand that? And so... Read those first seven chapters of Adventist Home. It will tell you how to do that. And those who are not in, in that area, I cannot do anything but give the biblical basis for pre-marriage counseling. Therefore, you got to guard mm -hmm. the precincts of your heart. You can't wear your heart on your shoulder. You have to say, Lord, you got to take this heart of mine. It belongs to you. Give me a heart like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think of um, marriage in the Bible, think of the very, very popular marriage of Isaac. Isaac was an older man. Now, who chose his wife? Mm -hmm. Did Isaac choose a wife? Mm -hmm. No. And then many people say, well, it's a blessed thing that when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. God did not put, send Isaac on the search for a wife. Hello? Because God knows our heart. He knows the heart. That's Jeremiah 17, 9. It's wicked. See, our understanding of marriage is shaped by society and shaped by television and theater. And the word love is used so loosely, human love 
God does not destroy human love. He repackages, you know, and the whole thing. God's love is agape. Human love is eros. It's emotional. It's emotional. So God does not cast it out. He want to package it where it be under control. So when we say something like this, I really love that dress you got on. Now, why are we saying express we love that dress? Is because that dress really appeals to me. So I love that, I love that food. I love that car. Have you anybody ever said that? You ever use the word love like that? Most definitely. And that tells us, ingrains in our mind, our understanding of love is what that object does for, for us. us. Did you understand that? Because if, if, if the dress didn't look good, you don't love it because it looked terrible. If the food don't taste good, you don't love it because it don't make you satisfied. So we looking for love in this way, what that person can do for me. Hmm? So you see an interest, you see a lady, look nice, intelligent, got all these skills. You said, now, she mm -hmm. definitely is a gift for God. I'm going to marry her because she looks nice. She got these talents. Oh, if she makes some good cake, hmm? that's the <laughs> wrong step. Take I'm just a bit. Uh huh? What's that? If I can, if I, if we have time for me to chime in just a bit um, on that question too. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess I would just round out uh, contribution on that question to say that I guess sometimes men can be so quick to, we can be so quick to jump into the next step that we're not really focused on being in the moment. Um, and so when you're you, know, you getting to know someone as a process, do you even know who this woman is? Do you know what she likes, what does she like to do, what are some of her hobbies, her interests, her, um, what does she like to read, um, who are the friends that are around her, have you, you know, met them, have you talked to them, and I mean, I think just spending time being a friend, um, I think is really important in a process that sometimes can get skipped over when we're so quick that, you know, the person was alluding to, you know, without looking thirsty or creepy, um, and it's because you're jumping to the, you know, step Q when just, you're just still on A, right? And like, you don't even know who this person is, um, you know, from, from Jump Street. So I think that um, it's important to spend time and it's short, I think we could probably talk about this for a long time about how our first couple interactions were. You, what, how did you label me as a question person, right? Like I was just actually <laughs> asking you question after question after question, right? Yes. Because <clears throat> I, I wanted to know what it was. Like I wanted yeah. to know like, she asked me a lot of questions. I don't want to interrupt right. you. No, I was just going to say that um, if I could give a suggestion from a woman's perspective, um, like the question said, you don't want to feel like you're being, without knowing you, you're so direct, like, hey, you know, let me take you out. And it's like, whoa, I don't even know who you are. You know, that that's the type of stuff that we don't really respond well to. Um, especially, I don't know if anybody in here is, from New York City, but growing up, it's common to just be walking on the street and like guys are like catcalling and saying all that stuff. Like, if you are coming as a as a as a man of God, that's not going to help us respond to you because you might get that all the time and just like just you know those type of creepy comments all the time. Mm. I think with in my experience with Brandon, um, you can tell something without having to tell something, and mm. what I mean by that is. Not only was he asking me a lot of questions whenever we saw each other, but he was always asking and showing interest in what I was doing. So we met on a college campus, which is a you know a different environment. But he was always like, "Oh, are you studying tonight? What library are you going to?" Or you know, "Oh, did you did you grab lunch or dinner yet? Do you want to meet up at you know whatever?" And then when we would meet, it was just like friends talking. It wasn't even you know and like. Although he asked me a lot of questions, it didn't feel like he was he was creepy or he was like asserting himself in my life in the position that he was. And I felt like he was genuinely just trying to get to know, oh, so you're from here. Oh, okay. So um, would you like, it, it was just like regular conversation. And that's what I think as a woman we want to feel the most is you're just a normal person trying to be a friend. Anything more than that, we start to feel like, 
get away, get away, get away. It's so, <laughs> that, that's what I right. would say. Because even when it comes to intimacy, right, like men are very like ready, you know, re- ready, ready to go, right? But for women, like it takes. Am I? Am I did I go too far? Am I good? <laughs> 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 All right, let's, let's stop there. I try to get into real, but but anyways, you know, women, it you know, takes a long, a longer time for a woman to get comfortable, for a woman to really, you know, open up herself. Um, so you know, especially like emotionally and just like to this person. So I think just cultivating, developing that friendship um, and that, you know, just basic getting to know this person is really important. And taking cues is important too. Um, taking cues. So if you ask me, what am I doing? And I'm clear that like I have plans with someone else. I'm getting together with other friends. Um, don't like try to push on that. I think like you were just like, okay, so when's the next time you're available? So it was like constant showing like, hey, I'm trying to like, spend time with you or, you know, see where you are, but it wasn't aggressive is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. So. Good. Very good. So I I think I have a question to follow up to that. How how does someone or how does a male approach a woman when maybe they aren't in the confines of a college campus or a church? Like, how does that then become, you know, how do they not appear thirsty if they don't have that commonality of being able to say, hey, you know, you going to the library or are you meeting up with friends? Like, how do they then approach it from that angle? Because a lot of people are kind of past like sharing common areas, I guess. Mm-hmm. Group outing. Um, so are you even in a position where you're in the same circles with the person? It may not be school or church, but I don't know, like, is there an event happening and like, yeah, is there an event happening that you might be going to or the person might be going to where you can kind of see each other in that group setting and then while you're there, you can take the chance to just say, hi, how are you? Okay, yeah, you know, sky is pretty today. Like, I don't know. <laughs> the, the Group setting, like, that's, I highly recommend group settings, especially in those initial stages where you're getting to know someone. I know that with the pandemic and everything being virtual and online, it's a little difficult, but even something as simple as, the chat or the community boards where, you know, questions and conversations are happening. There's like the icebreaker thing. Like that's a great way to be kind of like in the mix without being so direct with the person so that your presence is kind of able to be known without being overwhelming. That's that's all I could think of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. We're gonna move on. We have some singles asking questions about future future life and marriage. So this question has nine votes. Some women want a career and some men want a housewife. How can singles effectively communicate and be upfront about their life goals and desires early in courtship to avoid surprises, quote unquote, later on in marriage? Mm -hmm. I I didn't get the first part of it. Okay. So we have some women want a career and some men want a housewife. How can singles effectively communicate and be upfront about their life goals and desires early in courtship to avoid surprises later on, especially in marriage? Yeah, um, when we work with with couples and coaching, um, one activity that we oftentimes do is have them write down their relationship goals, um, each of them individually, and um, then we'll have them share them, you know, together um, with one another and practice, you know, active listening, that sort of thing. Um, so I think that just really doing that activity can be helpful, um, writing down how do you, oh, I missed the question now, oh, um, but how, how can um, this person what was the question again? Um, How can people effectively communicate what their goals are and their right. desires for their family um, yeah. early on? In- right, right. So I think just brainstorming about what does that look like for your short-term relationship goals, for your long-term, you know, family goals, um, and then having genuine discussion about what does this person see for their future together. Um, and if it's not compatible, if it's not, you know, aligned then I would encourage you to, to really talk that out. And it, are, are you firm in like this being exactly what you want to do? And are you firm in this being exactly what you want? And then if that's not compatible, then I think that you two begin to question, you know, is this the best relationship that we need to be in? 
Um, if you have goals that are not aligning with this other person's goals, uh, that's fine. It's, it's okay. You all can, you know, I guess, you know, think about this relationship, the, the future of that relationship, you know, and whether or not it needs to continue. But um, my, my first thing would just be to, to brainstorm what exactly are those relationship goals right. in the short term and also in a long term fashion so that you all can be on the same page. Um, with that, I do want to acknowledge that sometimes people bring their representatives first when they're getting to know someone in the beginning. So, for example, if that question is asked too early, it's easy for someone to be like, yeah, I want to, I want to be home and take care of the kids when that's not really what they feel inside, but because they like you and they want you to like them, they might not be 100% transparent about how they feel or what they really want, what they think they're going to say, what, you know, you, what they think you would like so that they can continue to get to know you in the hopes that when they do actually reveal what it is that they like, they, you would be, you would like them so much that it might not matter. And obviously that's being dishonest and that's not being um, forthcoming, right. but I do want to acknowledge that people I've been hearing people do do that. Um, so with that, I think, I think it's going to come from asking questions and there are a lot of resources out there that you can use on questions to ask when you're getting to know someone in a courtship, but it's going to come from asking like, what's the vision you have for your family in the future? Um, how, what, what, what do you, cause that's one of the activities too. You even ask, um, you know, who do you see taking care of your children in the future? Right. Um, what do you want to, what, do, what do, oh, you're in this career. What do you hope to accomplish in this career? Like, where do you see yourself going? Like, it's going to come from asking questions is my thought, but let's, yeah. let's Wait, get one more yeah. thing. Is there also, that there can, there, there can yeah. be seasons to this marriage as well. So there could be, like, if you all talk about it, it's like, well, like, I really do want to care for our children that we may have in the future, but I also would love to pursue a career later on like those two goals can be compatible, mm -hmm. right? Where there are, there's a season in your marriage where perhaps you are, you know, speaking from the perspective of the wife, that you are caring for the children and, and looking after things in the home. But then after your children are past a certain point or past a certain age, you're looking to, you know, launch into whatever ministry or career or business or whatever that you were interested in. So I think there can be seasons. And I think that you know, having healthy conversation about what those goals are and seeing if they are compatible is a, is a, good, is a good starting point. Sorry, good that's, Dr. Jackson, that, go ahead. That's good and uh, it, it's workable, but also realistically, a lot of times when, they, when we get in marriage, we have these goals that we have planned and then a child comes along right away. You know, some, you, you hadn't planned for. And so that will deter. And then a mother and her career has some conflicts in, in uh, being able to be, have a career and, have, and be family oriented because something is going to go lacking. And you know what it does? It usually is the child. And then we see in the child things that come developments, character developments and all that could have been checked if I was at home. And so it's knowing what our actual goal and purpose is in, in the relationship. So it's fine to set those perimeters, but then you have to be realistic. If something, a child comes in beforehand, it will change everything that you've started out. Mm. Uh, also, and, also, and yeah. not to leave the child for the grandparents, because that's what we're finding now. The grandparents is trying to, is raising the children. Yeah. And that mm. caused emotional problems down the line. Mm. And you started off, and I think that should be definitely a discussion. There is a, a concept is used, it says, made it or match, made it or match. So you find that you can take a pair of socks, they can be made it come from the same source of socks, one can be blue, one can be red, but they're not match. So there's questions asked, go down the line, made it or match, as you're saying, you must ask these questions as far as you're Mm -hmm. your, your spiritual goals in life, your mental goals, your physical goals. These are questions that need to be addressed 
where you see or you made it or match and where you're not match, you know, things be worked out before you take the next step as far as dealing with courtship. And so I think it is very wise to have that pre coaching or constantly pre marriage coaching or constantly helping the couples to work out their vision of life. Of what they're going to do. Because they ju jump into marriage and see things on the outside, but we don't know what's going on the inside. Mm -hmm. So what you approach is to definitely address those things early on in the relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, engage, can engaged and married men have female friends? Well, I know one. Say it again. Can engage, can you hear me? Can engage. Can engaged and, yeah, can engaged and married men have female friends? I know of one engaged woman who doesn't want her fiance. Wait. Oh. Can have a friend. Yeah, who doesn't want her, her fiance to have any female friends. How can women guard their relationships while allowing the other person to maintain balance while having friends? Now, let me hear you. You're saying, can, if, if I say I'm, a, I'm engaged with my wife, I'm right. engaged with this woman mm -hmm. here. And yes. Therefore, I'm, I have friends with other females. Females, females right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the. Uh, lady he's engaging having problems with that absolutely so it seems as though so it seems as though the woman doesn't want her fiance to have other female friends okay mm -hmm. yes what do you think about that well so to speak with the best <laughs> so season with salt grace grace the young folks out there, what do you think? Um, there can, it'll have to be a, a understanding about that. Would you say guarded, very guarded? Very, very, very guarded because even um, you find some may not be have your interest and then you have the some that, that the devil uses you're talking about the person that the engaged man is uh -huh. okay. mm -hmm. can cause some problems they they he may uh start to you know draw closer to that friend and that's going to cause a friction in the in the relationship to so, the point that you know for me, mm. I would be very cautious of that. Why? Because of how the 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 reaction, what you do with them, would make uh, a difference in, mm -hmm. and then we would have to have a relationship that's so close that it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. and sometimes that that takes that takes some. Uh, real uh, prayer matter. Mm -hmm. That's the, even like, for instance, you can be married mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. your married, and then mm -hmm. some of the ladies in the church have a lot to say, and they come up, and the way in which they carry themselves, they're flaunting fl or flirting, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. It, it, the devil can use that. So we have to be very prayerful with that. Yeah, I was going to quickly say there's like a line between boundaries and being insecure. And you have to kind of ask yourself where you're falling between that and your motive with your fiance not having any friends. Um, it's impossible to avoid not having any contact or interaction with Correct. other people. And you don't want that because that's not going to be healthy, right? right. Um, but I think it's important to just sit down and talk about what your boundaries are as a couple and pray for guidance and resolution on how to 
approach that in a way where you both can respect each other's position because there could be some there there could be some insecurity right which is why she doesn't want him to have any female friends maybe she was hurt in the past by by someone who had a close friend and something happened and so being sensitive to that how can you meet her where where she is while also helping her build the trust that she will need that you are not going to Mm -hmm. you know violate her in that way um i'm very thankful because in our relationship i never had any concerns about um any type of friendship or anything that Brandon had, because from day one, he made it very clear, you know, what his intentions were. And I could see that he wasn't going to be over here, like flirting or doing other things. Like his, his character really showed for itself. And I truly pray that my sisters in Christ can have that in their relationships where you don't even have to question if this person is going to do something because their character really shows that they are respectful of you and they're delicate with your heart. Um, But we also have boundaries as a married couple about what's acceptable in our interactions with other people. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're going to have to find that place um, uh, and and where you all stand and come to a resolution together on what's going to be appropriate or not. Every marriage absolutely needs boundaries. You do need to protect the sacred circle. So you, you are going to have to do that, but you have to work together instead of forcing one person to do something. You're going to have to work together. Absolutely. Very good. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's a book that I want to recommend. I read it with my book club. It's called Boundaries. Um, I think a lot of people may have read this or heard of it. Uh, it's by Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. I think it's really good to have boundaries as a single person and then that yeah. transit over when you start your courtship and all of that because you already have these nice walls or in place for your relationship. Yeah. So, boundaries. Read it. We have another question. So I grew up in a family where everything was an argument. And because of it, I have become very averse to conflict. What are some practical tips besides therapy that I can use when I have to have uncomfortable conversations or be open to them? So how are we going to become open and have uncomfortable conversations in a family that has a lot of conflict? Are they bringing this into a marriage situation? I, I'm not picking up anything about marriage right now. I think it's most, mostly communication and a familial relationship. Just relationship. Just relationship. Conflict. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What steps should be out to address that? Yes. Repeat that. How, how, so how, so how, do we, how does this person um, have uncomfortable conversations or be open in a family where conflict was a huge thing. Everything was an argument. Everything was a, con- a conflict. Um, so I, I'm assuming this person has now become closed off and doesn't feel comfortable communicating. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they become shut in and definitely reserved right. because there's a definite fear of having that effects, effects in your life. So you know, we deal with conflict resolution communication. First of all, I will have to encourage truly the person. They got to deal with some emotional uh, pain that they re- receive from that family situation. And I've seen uh, carry on into the life. So first of all, there has to be a recognition. It goes back to, again, those three needs, especially significant, and that identity where they are into a conflict, they can be demeaned, misunderstood, and they grow up or experience that and carry on into life. So we try to help a person to truly find the affirmation that they so definitely need. So conflict definitely destroys that argument, especially in the family, and that person to carry on. So we try to help them to find out who are they? Where is that identity? in Christ? Where is the affirmation? Uh, where does it come from? And first of all, uh, I didn't come from a home or argument because I come from a single parent home, but conflict happens even in family. So I grew up understanding that, but once I understood why the conflict takes place, you know, I think it's in Proverbs chapter 13, 10. It says, only by pride comes contention. contention. 
So therefore, self is at the center of this conflict. So once you understand that all conflict has a source in self-centeredness, that you're trying to get your point across, you're defending your own territory at the expense of other people getting hurt. So you grow up in that environment, now you need to come to grips with reality. Where are you? So self-centeredness, how can I overcome this? How can I overcome this, this feeling in my heart that I want to avoid? I want to avoid all conflict myself. I definitely want to avoid it. However, it's impossible. Now, I seek not to be the instigator of conflict, but I get in meetings that's conflicts. You know what I do? I found out that in, even in, in, in ministry and in conflict, now in my marriage, there's not a conflict. We might have disagreement. You see, holding on to an opinion or, or holding on to it, you just root in. It's the pride of opinion. But to have differences of opinion and looking for a solution, that's a different thing. I don't, it's not a problem for a person have a different position than I have, but it's the pride that holds on to it, that you are rooted and grounded mm -hmm. in there, and there's no reason you just hold on to it. That's what destroys. So the person that comes from that type of experience must come to grips, must be helped to find their security in God and who they are and how they viewed it, how they approach it. So if my wife, this is, we having a conflict, arguments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact is, what should be done? I got to step back from that. Mm -hmm. I got to understand that she had, as mentioned this, but she has a problem of coming across a certain way. I have a problem interpreting that and reacting to her situation. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying that two people with a problem, if they can take the eyes to Jesus and see that that person is not their problem, and I'm not their problem. What we see happening is, is that there is a spirit which is working through our weakness. Case in point, when Peter tried to kindly rebuke Jesus, Jesus said, get me deep behind me, Satan. So he was not calling Peter Satan. It was a spirit that working through him, speaking through him. So I've come to grips with reality that mankind is not my problem. That's not my enemy. And so when we see that, we're going to raise, con when, we, when we don't see that, conflict going to come because we're trying to convince this person of my position. So I have to come to the reality that that person is not my problem. I have a problem the way I interpret and the way I perceive what's going on, and therefore I react to that situation than respond to it. Mm -hmm. So first of all, rediscovering, reclaiming who I am in Christ and recognizing that he has put value on my life and that I can, in a very compassionate way, state my position clearly without invoking, provoking any wrath from that person. Mm. So that has to be, you know, taught, trained, educated, help a person realize that conflict is a result of self-centeredness. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Sarah, I'll just quickly add that, um, you know, when I thought about this question to this person who asked it about practical tips to have uncomfortable conversations, my first thought went to what Dr. Jackson shared earlier around being um, slow to speak and being quick to hear. Um, and I think that that is uh, wise counsel for this situation as well, that when you're in these uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversations, really practice those tenets of active listening and being patient to make sure that you understand mm -hmm. whatever it is that someone is communicating. Um, and then also taking time, not just to listen, but then also to reflect back to this person that to this group that you're having a conversation with, what it is that you are hearing on your end to make sure that they have the opportunity then to correct or to, you know, refine or to edit whatever they said. Um, to make sure that the correct message is being communicated. So I think sometimes there's, that conflict could be happening because, you know, you're receiving the, the, the message that, that you think you're hearing, but they're not actually communicating that message that you think you're hearing. Um, so that's one point there. And then also, 
sometimes it could be helpful for you to, if you are having this group family, I'm thinking about a family at a, at a dinner table, having these difficult conversations, um, somebody that you respect, somebody you look up to, an, an elder or pastor, or someone that you, that you reverence in that way, um, to invite them into that conversation, if it's a safe place, safe space, to be able to help navigate, you know, as, as a neutral party, right, in those conversations, you know, whatever may be going on. So um, you can be open to them, you know, by open to these difficult conversations, by um, acknowledging as well that conflict is going to happen in relationships. And we talked about this earlier, that, you know, marriage and friendships and others can really refine our characters. Those conflicts are going to happen, but it's really the, the blessing is in how we deal with those conflicts, how we navigate them, how we listen to one another, how we're slow to speak, and um, how we're getting counsel from others as we're navig as we're making our way through those conflicts. So I'll leave it there, Sarah. Thanks. And if you're someone that gets flustered, like you start losing your thoughts because things are getting a little tense, or um, you feel challenged and you, you're not quite sure that what you're saying is coming across the right way, you can also try writing it down. So write down what the issue is, what you have to say, what your points are, so that you kind of have a reference point to, to keep your mind, you know, a little bit more at ease and focused when you're having these conversations. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because yeah. I think um, that's a really great tool, um, the writing down. I saw someone in the chat say that, like, write that person a letter of everything you would want to say. Um, <clears throat> this week, a student got me upset, so I came home and I just spoke out everything I would have said if I wasn't at work. And I just found that, you know, that is going to help me in having that conversation with that student. Um, so writing, writing down, speaking out, those are definitely things that are extremely helpful. Right. Just one thing, you know, as it was saying, you might not even see the screen, but anyway, there's three obstacles that are preventing, and you might not because the camera, but let me just share that. Three obstacles preventing resolving conflict. Number one, it was mentioned, if we do not acknowledge that there is a problem, that's number one. Can you, if you do not acknowledge, can you? Can they see this on the screen there? Okay. We can see, we can see it. I'm also going to type it in the chat as you speak. Okay. okay. Do not acknowledge that there is a problem. Blaming others for the problem. Do not embrace scriptural principles in resolving the problem. Those are three obstacles, obstacles. that prevent conflict resolution. We we'll go to Genesis chapter 3, 6 to 13. All right. So I'm going to move on real quickly here. Now, there are needs to understand in order to resolve personal conflict, especially marital conflict, family. You know, there are generation problems, family issues inherited from parents. These are the easy to see because our parents' problems are most obvious to us. Strongholds, areas of continuous struggle. Satan has bound and we cannot get free. In these areas, we experience frequent temptation and never seem to get free. Then blind spots are areas we do not see, problems we do not see in our own life. So let me move on here. Now, 10 steps. I won't go through all of them. I think you alluded to this. First of all, set a time and place for discussion, as Brandon was talking about. Find someone that you can really talk about this. You got to set a time. Number two, define the problem. What is the problem? Be specific in the problem. List the ways that you each contribute to the problem. You know, if, you got, if I got a conflict with my wife in here, let's share how she contributes, how I contribute. Does that make sense to you a little bit? You know, how I contribute, how she contributes mm -hmm. to the problem. The next, list past attempts to resolve the issue that were not successful. We got to go back. And number five, brainstorm. Pull your new ideas and list 10 possible solutions. So instead of going back and forth, now, like I tell my staff, I said, look, we got an hour meeting, hour meeting. Now, I just want to spend five minutes on the problem, <laughs> five minutes on the problem. Then I want to spend the next 55 minutes on the solution. Mm -hmm. Then I go on, discuss and evaluate each of these possible solutions. Be objective. Agree on one solution. I go on on. Ten ways in which I deal with these conflicts. It's all over there. And, and even if it's my wife, or anyone, they got, like you said, they have to be conscious of it, acknowledge, write it down, discuss it, but they got to have a plan of action because you're not mm -hmm. going to solve it by keep talking about it. Mm 
-hmm. Got to stop. Let's pray. Let's put it on paper. So I'm just reinforcing what Brandon already said. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those are some steps we take. All right, I think we got that in the chat. Thank you so much. Very, very, very helpful. We have time for one more question before we wrap up. Maybe two if we get through these. So, <laughs> hopefully two. Maybe time for one more. Two more. Yeah, let's, yeah let's, try to, let's try to get two more in. We have about 14 minutes left. So, how do tactfully, how do you tactfully handle a spouse or significant other while courting who has communication issues. So for example, this person might give you the silent treatment when they are upset, they may have explosive outbursts, or they may not, they may be yelling where you can't even get a word in. What is best to separate yourself from the situation or the person? Or how do you handle this conflict? You, for, for you, speak, you said, is this in a, a marriage relationship? This is the or, in relationship. Yes, of course. Yes. Okay. Now, in a courtship, so read it. Read it again. Okay. So we have um, communication issues in a courtship. So someone okay. who is yelling at you when they're upset, being explosive, and you can't get a word in, or they're giving you the silent treatment when they are upset. Okay. All right. Let them go. Mm. I'll pick up the rear. Oh. We pick up the rear. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to be as quick as possible. So um, it, it definitely sounds like there's a need to learn effective communication skills because all of these are things of what not to do when you are trying to get a point across. The first thing I would recommend is when this is happening to try a timeout um, if things are getting too heated. Um, Try a timeout where you both kind of separate for an agreed about agreed amount of time. Um, so whether you agree, like, look, let's if we were, this is getting a little too tense. We need like an hour, and then we'll come back and try to talk about it again. Um, let me go pray, cool down, whatever needs to happen. Like you just need to be clear on how much time you're taking apart. It can't just linger, you know, into however long. Take a timeout to just process and. Um, try some of the things that um, Dr. Jackson just shared in the in the previous slides, um, but definitely recommend when it's getting too too heated that you need to kind of take some time out. Um, but if it's a repeated pattern where this person is continuing to um, get, communicate in this way, um, number one, that's probably learned behavior, so that's probably from you know the home that they grew up in or this different circumstances they've been in. So unless there's steps taken to communicate better. Um, that's when you're going to have to ask yourself, especially if it's before marriage, mm -hmm. you know, is this something that you can continue to, 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 to deal with and respond with if the person is not willing to take the steps to make improvements in how they're sharing their emotions and frustration? I'll be honest with you, it's a lot of times it comes from how we were dealt with when we were two, three, four years old and having emotional outbursts. How we were dealt with in those moments is, is, is how we tend to be in our adulthood when we get frustrated and when we don't like how something is going and we need to respond on it. So it goes a lot deeper than you think. Right. right. And, we, and we all, I think, for the most part, know when we can feel that feeling inside of us when we're having a conversation and you, and you feel it's getting tense and your your words are becoming, you know, a little bit, you know, more chopped and you're just getting, you know, really agitated. Um, and, and those, you know, I guess, backing up a little bit, you know, from, from those, you know, feelings that you may be having, those are indicators that it may be good to, a good time to take a time out from the conversation to communicate that right now, this is not the best time for us to talk about this, but plan to discuss it when we're a little, little bit more level-headed. Um, so that may be a good indicator for when to separate yourself from the situation, um, but how to tactfully handle this person or the situation, what I would suggest as well, in addition, in addition to what Shredder was saying, I would suggest that you all do um, what we call a, um, a wish list for your relationship, right? And essentially, this gives an opportunity for any, each person in the conversation and the relationship to write down like what it is that they would like more of or less of in the relationship, right? And so as you're engaging in this conversation, each person has an opportunity to share and go back and forth, so and so forth. But it gives you a, a safe space to be able to share about whatever these issues 
are, you know, are that are going on and to allow your partner, your significant other spouse to hear what it is that, that, that you would like less of. So I would like this person to not be, you know, giving the silent treatment in our relationship, or I would like you to, to not, you know, give, you know, yell at me when we're having certain conversations. And then as you two explore that together, I think determine what next steps of intervention might be needed. So is it counseling? Is it, you know, relationship code? Like what, like whatever it, whatever you all determine during that, you know, during that exchange should be the path that you all take to hopefully bring healthier communication to your relationship. Um, so if you do that, if you take those steps and do all, do all those um, um, interventions and things, things still don't change. And I think that if you're courting and you certainly want to begin to think about, you know, am I, are we compatible with this make for a, a happy and healthy yeah. relationship? So, um, Dr. Jackson. Bottom yeah. line, cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> those are, those are red flags. You know, and yeah. you see the flags beforehand and you get into something, it's just going to get more intense. <laughs> I, 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 I like us not living in denial. I love us. Yeah, absolutely. And we run in the other yeah. way. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. I also years. feel because I did grow up in a family where, you know, silent treatment was a thing or... Wow there's an issue and we're not really talking it out and then you pretend like nothing happens and you come back and it's supposed to be like all, all, all right. good. Yeah. Learn through other relationships and, and friendships how to be more effective in communication. So I want to be a little nice, but yeah, you're right. It could be a red flag, so. <laughs> in court. Yeah. Well, see, if that continue in a courtship situation and there's no evidence of any improvement because it, it takes more than a day or two. Because mm -hmm. you remember you mentioned, my dear, that this goes all the way back to childhood. Right. Ingrained. So that's going to be a process. And as my wife says, she, she kind of, you know, has that male thing. <laughs> you know. But the point is that I agree. Those are serious red flags. Mm -hmm. Because if it's not resolved, I mean, totally resolved, where the person has given evidence, and you married by just... You coach, walk it over, and sometimes you sweep it under the rug mm -hmm. that they say the rug get lumpy. This is a suitcase that's going to open in the marriage. Those are flags. That's why I said you got to truly understand what is my role in this marriage, what's your role, and what words. Words are deadly. So how I deal with that person in courtship is a reflection how I'm going to deal with her when I marry her or Absolutely. vice versa. So I would not be, I'll pray the Lord give me grace because I want a marriage that will please you, even though this person got all the external qualities, but they argumentative, they are judgmental, they are self-controlling. What should I do? God said, wait on me. When you're talking about time, take time out. It might take more than a day. Take a time out. Pray. And, and I would suggest this finally. Do not pray only for that person to change because they don't get it. You got to pray that God give you a heart like his heart. So when you have a heart like God, you're going to see as he see, and you're going to be able with compassion and sensitivity to say, this is not going to work. I just had that recently. The person came to the conclusion, it's not going to work because it was too much irritation, agitation. So yes, take a time out, pray about it, and write everything down, as we say practically. But if there's no fruit in that life, because we can't judge the motives, but the fruit got to be seen. And I will caution any person into that relationship, don't make the next step till you see evidence that God is working. And if you're doing a lot of arguing beforehand, <laughs> you know, then it can get to be verbal abusive, and then it can be physical, you know. So it can, you know, where's the stopping point? Emotional. Yeah, stop abuse. it before it starts. That's right. Prevention yeah. is better, is than, better cure. than cure. Absolutely. Proverbs 26, 2. All right. Um, and we, we're really looking for that peace, everyone. We need that peace. Amen. So, Amen. Yes, don't sacrifice yes. that peace. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's better to stay single than to marry someone who's going to give you a headache. So I think it's in Proverbs. 
right? Yes. Forget what it says. Right. You don't want a miserable wife, and you don't want a bad headache. Oh yeah, I saw that. It's yeah, funny. forget, forget yeah. we're in, in progress. So um, I think we're gonna start wrapping up. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So, or do we have time for one more question? What do you guys think? We have four minutes left. Mm -hmm. One more? Okay, this we can make this our speed round. One minute to answer this question. Um, I thought this was a good question to end. How much communication is too much? I know one woman who texts her fiance often, and if he doesn't respond quick enough, she gets anxious. <laughs> How can couples in a tech-wired world learn to communicate effectively beyond their use of technical devices? So I'm going to go ahead and put a one-minute timer on for each couple, and let's go. Let, let the Google babies do that because <laughs> okay. we, we didn't have, we didn't have no text when we was doing the ship. That's right. We, we, we wrote letters, <laughs> yes. telephone yes. calls. So let 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 them take care of the business because I don't have that experience. <laughs> That's not, I don't have that. Ex I'm not experienced in that area. And I don't and I don't think that there is too much communication in a relationship. Okay. Because I believe that that is the blood of your relationship and the, and the life of the flesh is in the blood. When you have communication, you can be able to work it out. Yeah. Now she's saying that the woman is text. I mean, the person is texting, 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 texting. Oh, we don't have text. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's you, all go you can close out with that. Because my <laughs> yeah. wife said you cannot have, what's your truth? Communication is the life blood of relationship. Effective communication, not complaining. Right, right, right. Communication. Go ahead, man. Let, go ahead. Um, I, I agree on that point that there's never too much communication. I don't think this is a communication issue as much as it is a expectation. Right. And right. Absolutely. yeah, absolutely. You, um, you know. These phones have definitely made us feel like we have access to people 24-7, and I love that you all are bringing out the fact that that wasn't reality before. Like, <laughs> we did not always have – I'm, I'm going to say young, but I do remember pay phones, and I do remember when you left the house. <laughs> you what? You, you know, remember pay phones? <laughs> <laughs> Come you on, you don't remember pay phones. You saw that with them. them. <laughs> 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 have a way of communicating you had to wait until the person got back home unless they called you from the pay phone mm -hmm. so i definitely agree with that um i think number one ask yourself why isn't he responding quick enough because some people just are not on their phone they might have a personal boundary Absolutely. that they don't use their phone as much yeah, so if it's not good. something urgent um, I would, you know, ask yourself, why is it, and, and all the things we said before, right, sit down and have a conversation, like, when I text you and you don't respond quickly, I feel blah, 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 that way you can kind of talk out what the, what the underlying issue is, but number one, be mindful that people, other people have things going on, if it's not an emergency or something urgent, um, let's, you know, give grace. Um, we have we set up certain like important communication points. Like for us, it's important to me that you let me know when you get to your destination. I just need to know you're okay. Um, and it's important for you to let me know when you're on your way home. So I know, like, you know, just set up those, those step, like, like those posts where it's important for you to hear from each other. Otherwise, if you're at work and you're expecting him to text you back all day, that's not reasonable. He has yeah. to work, you know, and so forth and so on. That's what I would say. I want to speak to good. Right. Also, I mean, he already proposed to you. Why, why yeah. are you getting anxious? 30 seconds. So 30, I, seconds. Okay. 30 seconds. Um, 30 seconds. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I was just saying, if you already proposed to you, why are you getting anxious and insecure? Um, number two was also um, setting aside time, but whether it's a uh, each day or each week where you all just have focused time for your relationship to talk, talk about what's been happening, talk about what's been going on that day or something that's been bothering you, something that's on your mind, dedicated time for your relationship just to connect between the two of you can help alleviate, you know, where she feels like, you know, she's not hearing back or if she knows she can look forward to this, you know, gap of time you know, in the evening or, or this gap of time on the weekend where you, where you two can connect, you know, I think that that would help a lot with, this, with their communication. It's all right. 
All right, awesome. So I'm going to leave you guys with one more resource. We have Boundaries in Marriage by the same author. And I'm sure they touch on text and communication, all of that, because they talk about that in the regular book as well. So how can people reach you? Um, I think we did our final words. So how can people reach you or follow you online or see your work after, as we, as we wrap up? Doctor, yep. so give the website. I got my information on there. Oh, wow. Nice. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. And you also okay. So we have um, Dr. Uh, Levine and Dr. Thomas Jackson. Laverne. 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 It's Laverne. I'm Laverne. sorry. Laverne. It's, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So meet ministry. And then we have their phone number and we have. Also, their website here, and website. yes, and we have your email address as well. So take a screenshot, yeah. take a screenshot, screenshot, and then the tailors. How can we follow you online or in person, wherever you are? Yeah. Um, so short of typing everything into the chat box, you go and if you link to our website, LAH Ministries, LAH ministries.com that should take you to everything and be able to link to our social media pages and whatnot so thank you anika appreciate the thank you uh let's go looking out so um that's how you can get in touch with us okay okay so thank you, Sarah. you're welcome we have some questions that weren't answered so we're going to continue that on the Hubo um, platform we're going to have a discussion and you guys can come and we can comment and we can continue the conversation we also have an impromptu testimony time at 12 on this platform, I believe. Sarah, if you can just correct me, I believe it's at 12. Let's see if she's in the chat. Yes, okay. So it's gonna be at 12. It's just gonna be testimonies about your weekend, um, what you got from this experience and anything else that you wanna share of how God has been moving in your life. So look out for more information on that in your emails and on the platform. Okay, so. Oh, Sharetta also put her website, tokensoflovebook.com, if you want to check that out. Awesome. All right. So give me some hearts and some claps in the chat if you were blessed by our speakers. Some hearts and some claps. And yes, we are going to... Yeah. Oh, man. Yes. I learned so much. I'm oh, so grateful for you being on the, on the panel today. Thank you, thank you. All right, we're getting some hearts and some claps. And we are going to, the last announcement we have is for your love and your claps, you, that can translate into some monetary donations. So you guys can go ahead and donate at New England <laughs> youthretreat.com slash donate. Okay, we would love to see that appreciation translated to some dollars. So go ahead and we're gonna put that link in the chat for you. I did have to slide it in, yes, Jonathan. So I'm gonna go ahead and close with a prayer um, and we will end here. Okay. <laughs> so Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the wisdom that we received today about communication, active listening, discernment, boundaries, conflict resolution, and all of the other things in between. Thank you so much for um, providing wisdom in, in your body, in your church, so that we can continue to do the work so that you can come back quickly. I ask that you bless everyone on this platform and their families, and I ask that you take us through this week safely. Please continue to grant us the desires of our hearts. In your precious name I pray, amen. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, with you. And God bless your marriage. Yes. And Sarah, yes. may God lead you. <laughs> <laughs> you keep me in my prayer that he will find me. Yes. Amen. <laughs>